All right, we'll start over. <laughs> My name is Matthew. I'm an alcoholic. Amen. Appreciate being asked to do anything for AA. Um, should be known speaking is my least favorite, despite the fact that I do it a lot. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to help anytime I'm asked to help. So the topic tonight is, what does membership in AA look like? And as I was thinking about that, I thought it might be good to think about um, both sides of it. What does membership look like before AA, and what does membership look like in AA? Um, I thought that'd be a good place to start with it. I'm going to read a little bit out of A Vision for You. I love this chapter. Um, and the, uh, the title of it especially, A Vision for You, it, it really sums up like kind of what the chapter is about. It's kind of what titles do. It, it, it's trying to paint a picture for the person reading this book. Um, you know, as you come into your own with Alcoholics Anonymous, this is what life could look like for you. But, of course, as it starts with most of our stories, it starts with the opposite of that. Um, so real quick, I'm just going to read this. It says, for most normal folks, drinking means conviviality, companionship, co and colorful imagination. It means release from care, boredom, and worry. It is joyous intimacy with friends and a feeling that life is good, but not so in those last days of heavy drinking. The old pleasures were gone. They were but, a, but memories. Never could we recapture the great moments of the past. There was an insistent yearning to enjoy life as we once did, and a heartbreaking obsession that some new miracle of control would enable us to do it. There was always one more attempt and one more failure. The less people tolerated us, the more we withdrew from society, from life itself, as we became subjects of king alcohol, shivering denizens of his mad realm, the chilling vapor that his loneliness settled down. It thickened, ever becoming blacker. Some of us sought out sordid places, hoping to find understanding and companionship. Momentarily we did. Then would come oblivion and the awful awakening to face the hideous four horsemen. Terror, bewilderment, frustration, despair. Unhappy drinkers who read this page will understand. Now and then a serious drinker, being dry for a moment, says, I don't miss it at all. Feel better. Work better. Having a better time. As the next problem drinker, we smile at such a sally. We know our friend is like a boy whistling in the dark to keep up his spirits. He fools himself. Inwardly, he would give anything to take a half dozen drinks and get away with them. He will presently try the old game again, for he isn't happy about his sobriety. He cannot picture life without alcohol. Someday he will be unable to imagine life either with alcohol or without it. Then he will know loneliness as few do. He will be at the jumping off place. He will wish for the end. So I love that beginning because I think it sums up especially for a person like me, what the end of alcoholism looks like before we wind up in a place like this. And maybe somebody's sitting in here and thinking, that sounds like life exactly right now. That's exactly what life sounds like right now. But I think everybody in this room probably can think back to a time in their life where that is what life looked like. And for, for a guy like me, it was right before I showed up to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And for the first few months that I was still going there, it kind of was like that too. So I came to Alcoholics Anonymous for the first time in the summer of 2011. I was 21 years old. I did not want to stop drinking. I certainly wanted the police to get off my back and my parents to get off my back and my girlfriend to come back. I had a lot of back problems. And <laughs> thank you all for laughing at that. Um, but what I found when I came here, I don't remember a lot. I didn't pay attention to a lot. I thought I was too young, too cute, too smart, too whatever to, to be what you people were. And I certainly didn't think I was an alcoholic. I thought alcoholics had long beards and, and long hair. Um, <laughs> but, and lived under a bridge somewhere, which... I had two, two out of three ain't bad, as Meatloaf said. But what I did remember is that when I was here and I would listen, you people laughed. I do remember that. I don't remember a whole lot, but I do remember that y'all laughed. People would tell awful stories from behind the podium, like things I would be like, I wouldn't have told anybody that. And not only would they laugh at themselves, but the people in the crowd would laugh. And I remember thinking, I wish I could have that. There's stories in my life I wish I could tell and, and laugh at. And in most of the stories I tell, people don't laugh at at that point in my life. And so did a little more research, came back to Alcoholics Anonymous a few months later after some very troubling times in my life. And when I came back, what I found was um, that you people still were laughing. And what I started noticing was when I started listening to the people that were talking, I started to realize um, maybe, maybe I was a little too hasty on this, I'm too young thing. I was a little too hasty on this, I'm too smart thing. Maybe I was a little too hasty on this, I'm too cute thing. Maybe I have exactly what these people have. Because the more I listen to speakers, actually listen to them, I realized more and more that I was just like them. Like when they told their story, circumstances might have been different, but the feeling was exactly the same. And it's that same feeling I read in that section right there. 
So on to the topic, what does it look like since then? Um, well, it, it wasn't sunshine and rainbows when I first joined AA. Uh, me and my sponsor, y'all think that we get along real good right now, but we didn't get along too good at the beginning. He had this draconian idea you couldn't smoke <coughs> weed and stay sober. Um, I, I thought it was ridiculous also, um, but he was right. So we had a little bit of budding heads to start with, but after I came to terms with the fact he might be right in that situation, um, and I started listening to the advice he started offering, I started to notice that my life started to get a little bit better. And what I noticed was is there were people in this group that, from my point of view, had been sober since the dawn of time, it, as far as I'm concerned. Three years was the dawn of time at that point for, for staying sober. I started noticing that people that I thought were like, you know, they graduated AA. They got like a, they, not, they don't have just an a undergraduate, they got a master's, maybe working on a PhD in, in AA. Those people were like showing up early at like 5.30 to like get here and like make coffee. I'm like, there's newer people that can do that. Why is this, why are these older people doing this? Uh, people that were the same kind of people, they'd stay late afterwards and like clean the coffee pot. Like you'd have to fight them to clean the coffee pot. They'd be out there cleaning it before you could even get a hold of it. They were taking newer people, leading them down the hallway, I thought maybe to like sacrifice them to whatever cult god we were praying to, but what I realized later, they were taking new people down the hallway at 5.30 every time we met to take them through the book, like my sponsor was doing with me. And I started to realize the more I paid attention, the more I started noticing that there was a lot of stuff going on in the background that was more than just that hour that we met for, that 7 to 8. A lot of people showed up from 7 to 8. A lot less people showed up from 7.30 to from 5.30 to 7 and from, from 8 to 8.30. I had to think about those times for a second. Um, and what I found was I found the next part of this section in a vision for you. It says, I've sh we've shown how we got out from under. You say, yes, I'm willing, but I'm, am I can be, to be consigned to a life where I should be stupid, boring, and glum, like some righteous people I see? I know I must get along without liquor, but how can I? Have you a sufficient substitute? I thought the exact same thing. I had a, a dean tell me early in my re recovery, um, he told me that the average age of death for an alcoholic is 50. And he, he told me that to scare me, like I'm going to die at 50. And I was 21 at the time. Now, I've told people that before, and they're like, yeah, at 21 years old, you don't think 50 is that long. I was like, no, I knew 50 wasn't that old. I knew that. But 50 years with alcohol sounded a lot better than 80 years without it. Like I was willing to trade vast portions of my life to be able to drink again still. And so when it came to having to give up alcohol at 21 years old, I thought, there's no way. I cannot do that. I need something to replace it. You don't understand what they did. You don't understand in my mind what alcohol does for me. Have you something that can replace that? And the answer to that was yes, we do. It says, yes, there is a substitute, and it's vastly more than that. It is a fellowship in Alcoholics Anonymous. There you will find release from care, boredom, and worry. Your imagination will be fired. Life will mean something at last. The most satisfactory years of your existence lie ahead. Thus we find the fellowship, and so shall you. How, can, how is this to come about, you ask, and where am I to find these people? You are going to meet these new friends in your community. Near you, alcoholics are dying helplessly like people in a sinking ship. If you live in a large place, there are hundreds, high and low, rich and poor. These are future fellows of Alcoholics Anonymous. Among them, you will make lifelong friends. You will be bound to them in a new and wonderful ties. You will escape disaster together, and you will commence shoulder to shoulder on your common journey. Then you will know what it means to give up yourself so that others may survive and rediscover life. You will learn the full meaning of love thy neighbor as thyself. So I think about as I started coming to AA more and more and started getting more and more plugged in, I started showing up at 530 with those, those people and, and helping making coffee, even if they didn't need me to help make coffee. I just showed up anyway. I started going through the book with my sponsor and reading the book with him, or he read the book to me. Um, as I got more and more sober, I started doing the exact same thing. Like The things that were shown to me by the older members, I started recreating those things around me because I, I didn't know anything else. I thought that's what you were supposed to do. You know, if you could get the coffee pot away from Kevin at the end of the meeting, you were supposed to clean it. That was the, that was the rule. Um, Mortal Kombat to get it from him. Um, and I think about still in, in this group, like I was thinking about it today. So we had an inventory on Saturday. Good home group members came, were part of that inventory. Love that they were there. A lot of people told me they couldn't make it because of travel and all that stuff. Not every date was perfect. We did the best we could. But that's not the point. My point is, is like, I don't know if anybody knew this, but this room... All the chairs were put away when we left Saturday. Some members of AA came that night and cleaned this carpet. 
Now, nobody in this room may know that. I knew that, and the people that did it knew that. But these chairs were back in place come Monday morning, ready to go. None of us are the wiser for it. Carpet's cleaner, though. Right? Somebody set those chairs back up. Somebody got here at 5.30 and helped make coffee. There was somebody here meeting with the sponsee beforehand. Somebody's going to stay after and help put chairs away and clean up and, and clean the coffee pot. And somebody's going to take a newcomer down the hallway again also at the end of the day. Like, we have service positions that have titles. And those service positions are nice. They're fluffy, whatever. You know, they make you feel important because you've got a name, a title after your name. But the most important service positions in this group are the ones that keep this group operating, that keep this group functioning. The people that show up here when they can show up here and that can carry water and make sure the work gets done. That newsletter that we put out every month, somebody puts a lot of effort into that to make sure those, not just one person, a lot of people put a lot of effort to make sure those schedules are, are maintained. So people make, do a lot of effort to make sure that the detox schedule is up to date, that the program schedule is up to date, newcomers is up to date, somebody compiles all that stuff. Not only that, but if you look in that, that, that newsletter, every one of those names next to a date is somebody that's carrying a meeting somewhere outside of this room to other alcoholics that are still suffering. And if you're sitting in this room right now, it's a good chance maybe you heard about this group as a result of one of those people, carrying a message to detox, carrying a message down to the colony, carrying a message to CASA, one of those places, carrying a message to a lawyer, and then that lawyer gets in, we get in their office later for something stupid we did. Like, it's unreal to me all the things that go into it. And, and the question of, like, what, what does membership in AA look like, there's a lot of answers to that question. That, that one right there answers it, I think, pretty well. It says a lot of things about what AA looks like. I think another section of the book that explains it very well is on page 161 in A Vision for You. It says, life among Alcoholics Anonymous is more than attending gatherings and hospitals. It's, it's more than just coming to meetings. Anybody can come to a meeting. You don't even have to be an alcoholic to be here right now. It's an open meeting. The Pope could show up right now. It's fine. He can come in. Uh, well, I don't know if he's an alcoholic or not. I don't know. I assume not. He might be. <laughs> but it's more than just coming here. Anybody can come here. What, what makes a real Alcoholics Anonymous member, what, somebody who's in good standing, if you want to call it that, is somebody that's doing these things, showing up when they can. And it, it, these are more things. Cleaning up old scrapes. Helping to fa- settle family differences. Explaining the disinherited son to his irate parents. Lending money and securing jobs for each other. When justified, these are everyday occurrences. No one is too discredited or has sunk too low to be welcomed cordially if he means business. Social distinctions, petty rivalries and jealousies, these are laughed out of continents. Being wrecked in the same vessel, being restored and united under one God with hearts and minds attuned to the welfare of others, the things which matter so much to some people no longer signify much to us. How could they? So I think about my first job in this group, my first official job, Brad got me as a greeter. We, had a, we used to do a thing where we'd always get two newer people to be greeters every single month. That was my first job. And, and it made me feel so special that it was my job to stand out there in front of that door and greet people. Now, I didn't know that that was what everybody did. I didn't know that that wasn't an official job, that, the, that there would be eight other people out there standing with me just like there was tonight. You have to run the gauntlet to get in this place when you show up here new. But it made me feel special and made me feel important that that was a job I had. And it showed me how important it was to meet people and greet people when they walked up. That if you want to get into this building, you're going to have to sneak in somewhere if you don't want to greet somebody, which I think is a beautiful thing. And, and that's a service commitment that people can make without any amount of sobriety time. Like, you can come up and do that. It doesn't take any amount of sobriety time to make coffee. No amount of sobriety time to clean up afterwards. No amount of sobriety time to greet the new person that walks in and tell them your name and change phone numbers. Um, those, to me, are the real solid members of Alcoholics Anonymous, the people that do that and, and give up their time um, Alcoholics Anonymous is a lot of self-sacrifice. I mean, it says at the very beginning that the solution to our pro- well, the, our main problem is selfishness and self-centeredness. So if that's my problem, the solution to that is the opposite of selfishness is self-centeredness. Self-sacrifice, thinking for other people before I think of myself, thinking of other people's needs. And I can think of no greater need that when a, when a, when a drunk shows up to Alcoholics Anonymous for the first time and they're embarrassed and they're humbled and they're beat down and they don't know what to do, what greater self-sacrifice is there to walk up to that person and say, hi, my name's Matthew. Are you new here? Do you need some help? Can I help you? What greater sacrifice is there than to say, do you need a sponsor? Here's my phone number. Is it all right if I call you tomorrow? Like, those are very important things that, that I think define what good membership in Alcoholics Anonymous looks like. And there's a lot of other things that go into the business of AA. But when it comes down to the fundamental aspect of AA, what drives Alcoholics Anonymous, it's one alcoholic reaching out to another and helping them. So that, that is what I think a member, what membership in Alcoholics Anonymous looks like. And um, I'm going to turn it over to 
Whoever's next. Oh, Lynn's going to kindly let Brenda go next. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Brenda, I'm an alcoholic. I kind of learn as I go along what it's like to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I learned from some of the best ladies I know in uh, Baltimore. I did not come in cute and smart. I came in completely desperate and not so cute and smelly. And uh, I was a falling down drunk when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and I did not take very good care of myself at that time. Um, the ladies and gentlemen there surrounded me. They took me out for coffee and they welcomed me very warmly. And um, I thought, I can't believe these people want me here. Um, I, I had a lot of baggage. Um, I had secrets that I thought I would never share with anyone. I thought I would die young and with those secrets I'd take them all to my grave and I heard women sharing openly about very embarrassing things and the more I heard those stories the more hope I had that if she can do it and now she's been sober 30 years then maybe I can too and um, AA did work for me and um, I haven't had a drink since my first meeting and I don't say that to brag, but I often talk about how my entire life, I got sober when I was 40, my entire life I half-assed every single thing I ever did. I never put my full heart and soul into anything I did, whether it be marriage, being a mother, any important thing or anything at all. And when I got to AA, I made a decision that this time I am going to give it my all. I'm going to do everything they tell me to do because if I don't, I don't think I'll be around for long. And um, I did everything they told me to. I worked the steps with a sponsor. And uh, then I was ready to sponsor anyone who needed it. And if anyone ever asked me to sponsor, I would gladly um, sponsor them. And I turned my life over to God on step three. And so therefore, I can go with the flow. So whatever's supposed to happen in my life and to me, then it will happen. And if, a, if I'm supposed to leave my home group and sponsor and find new, then um, I know that everything will always be all right in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not embarrassed of anything I've ever done. And I'm not embarrassed to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm proud of it. If I have a chance at work to share that with um, any of my peers, um, if they ask what I'm doing, I'll say I'm going to um, an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. If they ask if I'm drinking, oh, you're going to go drink this weekend? No, I don't drink. I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And... Um, Again, I, I think that things like that are meant to happen. So maybe somebody who asked me something or asked me what I was doing, maybe they were meant to hear that I'm a member here and maybe they know somebody who might need help or might need it themselves. And um, I like to be of service. I like to um, help other people who are struggling the way I was when I came in. I don't know that I, well, um, I was going to say, I don't know if I've met anyone as bad as me. I, the way I remember myself. <laughs> so I, I shook so badly that you could be down the road and you'd be like, damn. <laughs> She's really shaking. And I, I, was, uh, I was just a mess. Um, I had a uh, life insurance agent out to the house because... I wanted to just get as much life insurance as I possibly could so that my kids would have something when, when my time came. And um, there's no need to think like that anymore. That's a, that's a big difference. Um, being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous has allowed me to earn the respect back of my children. I learned that time stands for things I must earn and I had a lot to earn back because I had ruined it all. 
Um, that included with my family and um, friends and most importantly my kids. I always loved my children but I was not able to express that love to them in the way that a mother should and even that I learned how to do in um, Alcoholics Anonymous. The big book was like a map for my life um, and it talks about the family afterward and that chapter was very helpful to me because I really did want to go from a life where we don't pray, we don't go to church, and now I want to be like, let's let's pray, you know, and it, it kind of helped me to just take things easy, you know, don't, don't come home and ask for all these new changes, and really, the big book guided me along with my sponsor um, into a sober life and um, a membership in Alcoholics Anonymous allows me to be a grandmother with grandchildren that have never had to see me drink and um, it also helps me to uh, when I was drinking I, I had a few times when I d did drugs, I drank, there was a few times where things were just perfect. I mean, it was the perfect combination of this and that, and everything was just perfect. And when I got to AA and got to know these people, I got to realize that this is what I've been looking for. And I found it those couple times, but I never found it again until I got to AA and members here are able to laugh and be at peace. And that peace is, I resented those mothers that were so peaceful and could just watch the kids play at the park. Um, and before long, I was able to do that as well. So... Um, I think that's all I have. Thank you for letting me share. Great job, guys. You left way too much time, though. That is, <laughs> that is the only critique I have so far. That's the way God wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I'm Lynn, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, I'm also a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, when I first walked into these rooms, uh, I wasn't, wasn't really sure what that meant. Uh, and I wasn't really sure how to get there. Uh, when I walked into these rooms, I knew I was desperate. Uh, I, I had the gift of desperation. Um, I didn't realize at the time it was a gift. It sure didn't seem like a gift. Uh, everything that was happening in my life uh, had fallen apart. Uh, everything that meant anything to me, I was losing. Uh, I was selfish to the core. I was self-centered. Uh, and I was sick. And, uh, and when I walked in these doors, uh, I saw laughter. I saw people, uh, I saw people free. And I, I so desperately wanted that. I wanted to know what it felt like to be free again. Because for so many years, I'd been chasing. I'd been chasing an idea, chasing a feeling, um, and, and allowing fear and anxiety to wrap me up and, and, to, um, and to just totally consume me. Um, and then I came into these rooms and, and, uh, and, and started listening to some suggestions. Uh, and, and, and people saying that, you know, this, this, is, this is what I did. Uh, and they talked about sponsorship, and they talked about home group, uh, and they talked about steps and traditions. Um, and they talked about willingness. And, and if I would be willing to take some of these steps, to take action, that, uh, that maybe that maybe this disease that I was suffering from could be arrested. Maybe I could live free again. Um, and then maybe if I worked those steps and, and found that freedom, maybe I could, maybe I could help somebody else. Um, so 
to me, when the question's asked, what does membership in Alcoholics Anonymous look like? I think it looks different for everyone, every single member. Um, you know, we have the autonomy for it to be, well, for it to be what we need it to be. Um, and what I needed is, is I needed, I needed to learn how to give of myself because I had been so selfish. And, uh, and, and I, I needed to be able to be a part of because I had isolated myself so many times. And uh, the primary purpose group allowed that. Membership in Alcoholics Anonymous allowed that for me. And, uh, and it, it's ever-changing. It's evolving for me because, um, because I would like to think that I'm growing. Um, you know, when I first came in, I didn't know anything about anything. Uh, I was helpless, I was desperate, and I was sick and suffering. Uh, I got with the sponsor and I worked those steps. I found some, some freedom come into my life. And uh, one of the things that was suggested of me is that once I found that freedom, uh, once I was armed with facts about myself, to carry that on to another alcoholic and help another sick and suffering alcoholic, because that's what we do. So what does it look like for me? Alcoholics Anonymous looks like for me uh, uh, being a member of something, being, being part of something. Uh, like Matthew said, being here early enough to, to make sure that the door's open and that coffee's made and that, and that there's a safe place for people to come that are suffering. Um, one of the things that it, 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 it membership to me means is I, I remember, yeah, I was so caught up in, in, in learning gratitude and what gratitude looked like. Uh, I, I was sitting in the back row well before meeting because I had gotten here early because, you know, hey, my sponsor suggested start getting here early. So I did it. And I was sitting in the back and I was writing down on a piece of paper my gratitudes for the day because I didn't do it when I normally would do it. So I was kind of behind on my schedule and I needed to get my gratitudes down. And uh, my sponsor comes up to me and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm writing down, uh, writing down my gratitudes. He said, well, that's nice and that's wonderful. He said, but you know, there's, there's new people that are coming through the door. And you know, you could be a part of it by being out there and greeting them. And, and making them feel welcome at your home group. See, what he was teaching me was to take ownership in this uh, because this is my home group. And, and I am a part of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I get a chance to do for other people what was so freely done for me. Um, you know, Bill Wilson, more importantly for me, Dr. Bob, and some of the things that Dr. Bob would talk about. Um, just real quick, I'm, I'm going to read out of Dr. Bob's nightmare. Four of the things that Dr. Bob talked about that, uh, for him, one, sense of duty. Two, it is a pleasure. Three, because in so doing, I am paying my debt to the man who took time to pass it on to me. Four, because every time I do it, I take out a little more insurance for myself against a possible slip. One of the beautiful things I found out when I started trying to help other people was that it was helping me. That I was finally able to get out of myself, out of my self-pity, out of that victim mentality that I, I so cherished and loved and tried to wrap myself in all the time. And I started being a friend a friend would like to have. I started having meaning and purpose in my life because Alcoholics Anonymous showed me to get outside of myself, showed me how I could live free again, and in doing so, how I could help another alcoholic. And it has not only given me freedom, it has given me a life that I, I probably don't deserve. I sure as heck would fight anybody in this room to keep because it's a beautiful life. It's a, it's, it's a life where now I get a chance to be the father that my daughter deserves. I get a chance to, to be the son um, that a mother can count on. 
before my father passed away, I got a chance to be a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous and to help him in his time of need. And I would love to be able to tell you it's because I'm such a wonderful guy. But it's because my membership in Alcoholics Anonymous gave me a chance to change. It gave me the ability to be a new man, a changed man, a better man. I always thought that I had this terrible plight in my life because I was an alcoholic and I didn't deserve that. Turns out, one of the things that I've learned in being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous is since July 26, 2018, the thing that is probably the best blessing that's ever happened in my life was that God brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous showed me how to have a relationship with God. And in doing so, I was able to wrap around my head the idea of being an alcoholic and being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous today is the greatest gift of my life. And it's given me the greatest <laughs> freedom that I can think of. And with that, we're going to have about 15 minutes to uh, answer any questions that anybody might have for the panel. And thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Does anyone have any questions for our other two panelists or this <laughs> Questions? Anyone? I'll ask a question. Um, sure. How did, you, how did you decide what home group you wanted to, go, to belong to and how long did it take? <clears throat> Uh, actually, for me, it, uh, it, it was it was easy for me to find a home group. Uh, just a, a, a quick little story. Well before I ever got into Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, um, my my wife at the time introduced me to a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and of this home group. Uh, and at the time, uh, I wasn't ready, uh, and I thought I had a lot more answers than 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 what I had, and. Uh, Luckily enough, though, that, plant, that, that seed was planted. And uh, almost 10 years later, um, I called the wife that became the ex-wife. And I said, uh, I said, I think I'm an alcoholic. Actually, I'm pretty darn convinced of it because I had just gotten my third DUI. And, uh, and I said, uh, do you have the telephone number of that man from Alcoholics Anonymous? And she said, why? I said, because I'm an alcoholic and I need to talk to him. I need help. And uh, she said, thank God. And she said, I'm texting you that number right now. And when I called that number, he invited me down. And, of course, primary purpose has been my home group ever since. Matthew, Brenda. Um, I looked online. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous meeting schedules and there was one in Baltimore that met Monday through Friday at 6.30 a.m. So that was my definite choice and I just felt at home there when I got there. Um, and I went there um, <coughs> until COVID came around and then they had canceled it for a while but we ended up moving here and I really um, tried a lot of meetings. Um, I, uh, when I moved by myself initially, and then my husband joined me um, maybe six months later or so, and I mostly went to women's meetings because that's where I felt more comfortable. But um, then we happened to uh, stumble upon this meeting when he moved here, and it was just, um, it's kind of like buying a house. You know it when you find it, and uh, um, this was just a definite um, fit for us. So. That's how it worked with us. Uh, mine's quick. I, I, I grew up in this church. Um, so I, 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 uh, this is actually my nursery when I was a kid. This room just had a wall right here. But um, So I knew about a meeting here. Um, actually, y'all used to meet in the room around the corner in the basement back in that back room back there, and that was the youth room. So this podium was in there with... 
had a little logo on it that said AA, and on the back of it, we had written youth. So when it was AA, we had AA, and then it, we'd flip it around for youth. I don't know if y'all remember that. But that was, I didn't write it, but I was part of that crew. Um, <laughs> I know who it was, if you want names. Um, but truth be told, I hadn't gone to church in a long time. I was too embarrassed to go to church. I was too ashamed. Um, I felt too disgusted. I didn't think that I... Um, I didn't think that they would judge me. I just didn't think that I deserved any help. And I didn't think that, uh, I thought that they would be better off helping other people. But when I found out that there was an AA meeting here, I remember there was an AA meeting here. Um, I was at least comfortable enough to go in the building on a Monday night when I didn't think the prayer circle would be here <laughs> and, um, and go to this meeting. And it was, it was enough of a familiar place to me that I was willing to come in and stay. And thank God that I did. Um, this has been my home group ever since then. And I've loved it. And, Ever since I've come here, I haven't, I don't want to paint this picture like I, like AA, like every night I'm, I'm loving coming here. Like after getting off work some nights, I'm just like the best thing in the world for me right now in my mind is I just want to go home, sit on the couch, do absolutely nothing. Um, but I generally feel guilty after that. Um, and I'm a guy that, I, I, I forgot to mention this, but what does membership in AA look like? I can tell you also what membership uh, when you don't go to AA looks like too. Um, I decided one time that I, I didn't want to go anymore. I'm not going to come anymore. I'm too tired. I'm too busy. I'm too whatever. And I stopped going for several years. And what I can tell you is this. And then COVID hit, and that was an easy excuse. Uh, not, not the, never mind the fact the group kept meeting, um, but that didn't stop me from not coming. Um, <laughs> nor did I really care about COVID, so it was just an easy excuse. Uh, what I can tell you is this, at the end of it, I didn't go to meetings, I didn't help people, I just kind of existed. I didn't want to drink, um, but I can tell you one thing that I did want to do is at the end of it, I didn't want to die. Um, and so I knew the only place I could come that would save me is here. And um, it's just a reminder to me that membership in Alcoholics Anonymous is not always easy, it's not always fun. Sometimes it looks like getting a phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning from a guy who's drunk. Sometimes it's, you got to get here three weeks in a row because there's a scheduling conflict and you're chairing for four weeks in a row, however long I did it the other day, it doesn't matter. Um, that's not always fun, but it's a lot better than the alternative. And what I find is that when I come here and do those things, I always feel better in the end. No matter how terrible of a day I have, I'm always, be I'm always better when I come here and leave this place. So that's two questions in one. Yes, sir. I'm happy I'm an alcoholic. Hey, hey, um, what can members do or... People that want to be members that have a burning desire to be members but have like children and really busy lives outside of AA that can't show up early or stay late, what can they do to be better members? Those are great questions and they're, they're, there's no easy question or no easy answer to those questions. There are members who have had those hardships and have done it and there's members that, that can't. And really what it comes down to is I think the phrase of to thine own self be true. I was a guy that came in that didn't have a lot of that baggage. In fact, staying home was uh, that I know of. Yeah, that I know of. People ask me, do I have kids? I say, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, just get honest here. Um, but, what, what that translated to was I was a guy that could commit a ton of time to doing those things. Um, I was a guy that came with a license. Um, it wasn't for lack of trying, but I had one. And, and so it was instilled in me that if I've got a license and I'm coming to meeting, I should give people rides. And I did that for a long time. Um, I went to more than just this meeting. and I went early to those meetings, too. And I greeted outside of meetings that weren't even my meeting. And I helped clean up at meetings that weren't mine. I think, I think those of us that are able to do those things... Um, it's our responsibility to step up and do them when we're able to so that people that do have more difficult lives and more difficult situations that they're struggling through, that we can be there to provide that service to them. Um, and there are ways to do it, uh, you know, um, pulling, babysitting, all that kind of stuff. People find a way to do it. But I, I think from my experience, it's my responsibility as someone who has the time to do it. I should be doing it as often as I can for the people that... Maybe they do have kids they got to go pick up right before the meet, and they can't get here until seven o'clock. You know, um, that kind of thing. Um, and, and and we should try to, as the members that are able to do it, we should try to be understanding and receptive of that, and, and not give an air of judgment or criticism for people that just physically can't do it. Um, so, and I've seen other things happen too. By the way, if you have kids and they're a struggle and you need to come to a meeting, please bring the kids. We'll find with that. We'll find a room to put them in. There's plenty of men and women in this group that have clean background checks that would be more than happy to <laughs> watch your kids too. 
um, if, if you trust that. I've seen that happen before. I've seen women come into a meeting upstairs with a child. The child starts screaming, and I've seen two or three women get up and go ask and take that child out into the hallway so that mom can stay and have a meeting. That happens. And we, we are more than willing to do that for each other and help each other in that sense. So don't let kids be a reason you can't come. Bring them. We love kids. This is an open meeting. Anybody can come. Hopefully they'll hear something. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Matthew. So when I, when I got sober, my daughter was six. She came to a lot of meetings with me. And sometimes I would share, and she'd say, Mom, you forgot this part or that part. <laughs> uh, but also lady, ladies with kids, they could all talk to one another on the phone and um, be of service to one another that way. And um, we also record all the meetings that happen on Thursday nights, and that's a good resource. If someone wasn't able to get to a meeting because they couldn't get a sitter, they could listen to one of the um, speakers that we have. They're always great speakers, maybe one that they missed, uh, something like that. Thanks, Thanks for <clears throat> One of the greatest things about Alcoholics Anonymous is that you don't ever have to do it alone. There's a fellowship here. There's a membership that comes along. Uh, if you have kids, um, you don't ever have to do it alone. There are people here that will help, uh, especially if a person needs a meeting. Uh, it's it's the willingness that that you know Matthew had touched on it you know to thy own self be true. Um, sometimes we have to table the pride. Sometimes we table the ego, and say I need help. And if we're willing to do that, the help is always willing to be there. Thanks, Louis. Pleasure. I'm willing to have a call. This is not. Not to, I, I'm not saying this in like everything that's been shared today has been fantastic and wonderful, um, but this program and is those 12 steps and this membership exists so that we can have a life outside of here, and that doesn't mean to not come here. Um, but my responsibility first is uh, to my sobriety, and second to God, and third, to my family, and fourth, to Alcoholics Anonymous. And that doesn't mean that I don't come to meetings, because I do. And it doesn't mean that I don't do service, because I do. But I serve my family before I serve <coughs> these groups. Um, it's what I was taught. It's what I believe. It's what I do. Um, and I just think it's important to say that, because this meeting without saying that this meeting sounds a lot like you have to do these things in order to be a member and I just for anybody who might be new just want you to know that like you do not have to do any of these things to be a member to do those 12 steps to get sober to live well that's all I want to share thanks thank you thanks Will thank you. any other questions <coughs> Yes, sir. Uh, real quick, any pending health issues when you first came into AA, and, and if you had those, how did you overcome them, and how long did um, it take? Oh, yeah, how much time we got? <laughs> <laughs> Six minutes. Six minutes? Oh, that's not enough time. Um, yeah, uh, fatty liver, that's always fun. Uh, and severe mental health, like severe. Um, I came in here, I'd been seeing a psychiatrist since I was like probably 16. I've been on antipsychotics. Uh, antidepressants, anti-anxiety meds from the time I was about 16 until the time I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was, I tried like everything. Still when people are like, I'm trying a new uh, antidepressant, I'm like, what you taking? And they're like, they tell me, I'm like, yeah, I kind of like that. Not too much, didn't like the side effects. Um, so I was struggling pretty severely with, um, with mental illness, depression and anxiety and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was convinced that I was like incurable depressive, like it was going to be something I, I had come to terms with the fact it was going to be that way for the rest of my life. But as a result of working through the steps, working with a sponsor, 
um, being heavily involved in service work. I mean, our literature talks about that, like, my life as an ex-problem drinker depends on my constant thought of others and how I may meet their needs. It doesn't mean necessarily alcoholics, but just in everything that I do, whether it's my family, whether it's at AA, whether it's at work or church, I need to be thinking of other people before I be, need to be thinking about myself. And that's what cures our condition. And so in doing that, I started to realize um, maybe this isn't a permanent hopeless condition for me in terms of my mental state. And so in working with my sponsor and being honest with him and working with my doctor and being extremely honest and persistent with him, I, I talked about coming off those medications. And so he, he wouldn't do it at first. The psychiatrist did. He's like, dude, we've been working on this for like eight years. Like it's a fragile house of cards held together with bubble gum and, and super glue. Like let's not shake this, the house. But what ended up happening was I started coming off that stuff. And after maybe about four years, I, I came off all those medications, and I haven't taken any of them since. And that doctor ended up, I stopped going to him. Like, you don't hear much about success stories, but I stopped going to see him eventually because what's the point in going and seeing him if you're not writing his prescriptions anymore? And um, he told me the last time that we met, he didn't quite get it, but I think what he said is meaningful still. He said, I, I hate to see you go because I like just spending time with you because you're a success story. Like, the fact that, like, you got better. And I don't think many professionals see that, especially for people like us. They're used to burying us, not seeing us get sober and get healthy. And so that's not everybody's story. Some people are on those medications for the rest of their life because they need to be. But I was not a guy that was like that. But it took a lot of honesty, and it took probably four years for, for that to come through. And it took a lot of honesty and openness and taking the medicine as I was supposed to take it for that to happen. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Thanks Matthew. Matthew. <clears throat> Just real quick, I had, um, I never went to a doctor before, during, or after um, getting sober, but I know that I was gray in color, um, and I know that I had other obvious problems with my liver and my nervous system because I had panic attacks, and I talked about the shaking that I had for months, and it all, I smoked three packs of cigarettes a day. I no longer smoke. I did the steps around smoking, too. Um, I did have a time when I, I got sober when I was 40. I don't know how many years later, when I went through menopause, I did need an antidepressant for a time, and I didn't have any shame in taking that um, because it helped me over the hump. Um, but uh, it's amazing how your body heals itself. <laughs> Lynn's the picture of health, so. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, when I came in here, uh, like like many people, fought, fought through a lot of different things. Probably some high blood pressure. Uh, I don't know how fatty the liver was because I was in denial about going to see a doctor over those kind of things. Um, but yeah. Uh, what practicing the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous has allowed me to do is, is to today be a picture of health. Uh, I no longer have high blood pressure. Uh, I'm at a, a reasonable, maintainable weight uh, and, and very active, uh, playing some new sports that I had never played before. So uh, uh, enjoying my best life <clears throat> as a healthy member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thank you. That's a good question. Thank you. All right. Ready to break. Everybody ready to break? Everybody good? We appreciate everybody being here. And good job, you guys. Thank you. Wow.